We have risen from the ashes to school the masses. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Scholars of Wrestling Show, a special Halloween edition. Happy Halloween to everybody. I'm your man behind the microphone, Scholar Jeff. To my elsewhere on the screen, the one and only, the undisputed Scholar Tarek. Scholar Tarek, how's it going, sir? Boys and girls of every age, wouldn't you like to see something strange? Come with us and you will see this our town of Halloween. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Pumpkins scream in the dead of night. This is Halloween. Everybody make a scene. Trick or treat till the neighbor's gonna die of fright. I would keep going, but it is a pretty long song. Yes, it is, but you know oh, what? You face me. In all seriousness, come on. I actually watched that The Nightmare Before Christmas for the first time in like 10 years last night. You know what? I don't care what anyone says. Overplayed, maybe. Still undisputed classic. Modern day classic. I love it. Only movie you can watch it on Halloween and Christmas. I dig it. And do you dig it? Joining us this week, Mr. Scholar Charlie in his finest MJF cosplay. (laughs) Yes, it, it'll always be a classic to me. Grew up on it. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's to me, it's like it's a wonderful life. It's overplayed as hell, but it's still a good flick. We still love wow. it. Mm-hmm. A Christmas story is overplayed as hell. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. I'm going to give that another 10 years. It'll be just fine after that. Uh, but let's face it. It's pee pants city around here because it's Halloween we're just coming hot off the heels of Hell in a Cell and Halloween Havoc, as it, as it seems. So we have a lot of really spooky things just in time for the season to discuss this week. Kicking things off first with Hell in a Cell. Uh, real quick snap overall review of Hell in a Cell. What did all of you think about it? Uh, highlights, immediate reactions, straight from the gut, make it spooky. What do you think? I say you guys go first since you guys actually watched it live. I it I watched it later. Yeah, I had, I had to go back and watch the rest of it. I caught I caught the latter half of it late, but I actually came back to Bailey versus Sasha Banks, which I thought they absolutely killed it. That alone was worth the price of admission for me. I mean, ever since March and the whole Corona lockdowns happened. These two have been absolutely killing it, and this is no exception at all. This is as good, about as good of a feud ender as anything we'll see from, him, and that was and that is pretty damn good. Uh, let's see what else happened. The ending, the ending of the feud with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso. It just when I thought they these two couldn't have done have already done everything they possibly could, they came up with something new. And it was really impressive. The ending was dramatic. I got more sucked into it than I thought I was. And it was, that too was a ton of fun. Yeah, we opened with something like, you know, for the 24 7 championship, R Truth versus Drew Gulak. But, you know, it's fun for what it was. But again, when it needed to hit, it hit. And given the way, the, it seems like a total redemption from last year's Hell in a Cell, and it was excellent. Scholar Charlie, what do you think? Immediate thoughts, reactions uh, for Hell in a Cell? Um, all right, so uh, going into Hell in a Cell, uh, I had my reservations. I have been along with Tarek at the first Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, and that was a night that they tried to stack Three Hell in a Cell matches in front of a crowd. And we, I, th- I think I could speak for both of us, when it got to that DX uh, uh, legacy match in the cell, the crowd was absolutely dead. So I was worried that this it was going to get tiresome with three Hell in a Cell matches. But the way WWE started things off with nothing but great, fantastic storytelling it made the other two Hell in a Cell matches that much more significant when it comes down to just great wrestling matches in inside the cell. Um, I might break off into a scholar's quick talk if we can uh, with Retribution. 
What's going on here? Do we have to? What's going on here? (laughs) I don't think there's anything quick about that. Because any decency or 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 length in retribution or taking them the slightest bit seriously, if it wasn't gone at Hell in a Cell, it was sure as hell gone on Monday Night Raw. So how how do you guys feel about the current state of this? Because I think it needs to be addressed because it's ridiculous. (laughs) It's they are turn rapidly turning into a case of revisionist history. Early is a derailed project, much in the same vein of Nexus, where they've got this big explosive group. They enter, they they create something, and eventually they just get cast aside and thrown to the wolves. It's a damn shame, especially when we see someone like Mustafa Ali putting his heart and soul into this and really doing his damnedest to make something out of it, even to the point of using his own sort of bit of rewriting history, which I'm glad they at least did something with that little plot point. But ultimately, I, I want these all of these people to be something great, especially Mia Yim and Dio Madden. I want them to be something great. They deserve to be something great. But um, I just don't think this is it, but I severely think I'm wrong. And let's talk about the ref on Raw. Mia, 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 Mia. Hey, Mia. <laughs> she's hulking up. No, wait, she's having a seizure. Oh, my God. Uh, I understand you're not going to be like, reckoning, reckoning, <laughs> but... Do something other than letting the world know that doesn't already obviously know that it's me. Um... And I love how they're a fact like, okay, what was she doing? Was she having like a seizure or a stroke or something? On her. And or like, what? And then fooled you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, no, she was possessed. We wouldn't dare insult anybody with a disease like. So, in other words, you're joking around with the occult now. I mean, I know it's Halloween, but it's like, come on, stupid is stupid. But I digress. Back to Hell in a Cell. Uh, I'm Uh, I'm not holding this up. (laughs) The seal needs a break. You touched on Sasha and Bailey. It was an amazing Hell in a Cell match. Uh, Randy Orton and and, uh, McIntyre tore the house down, too. Um... Yeah, I got to agree with uh, what you guys were saying in the group text, though. Like, Randy won now, and and that's all well and great, but I think it's after the point that the trigger should have been pulled. Mm-hmm. Uh, the event as a whole set up uh, a good field for the aftermath and to lead into WrestleMania season and end out this year. So I got to give it a four. Full beard. Four out of five full beard. I dig it. Yeah, I'll second that. It was definitely full beard material just because of how unexpectedly good it was. Match quality alone, I think if this was a major pay-per-view, I would have been a little underwhelmed. But this, it definitely seemed like a good chunk of people, certainly not everybody, but a good chunk of people who were involved with this show definitely did their best to drastically improved their game over last year and it shows definite four out of five full beard for hell in a cell this way though as far as uh the the WWE championship picture goes going into this event you had drew mcintyre where if he retained had a future of randy orton and now you have randy orton as champ with a future of fiend miz mcintyre all simultaneously. Mm. It's definitely looking good, but Fool, your overall thoughts on the show, highlights, and final beard rating on the show. Oh, boy, this is going to be very interesting. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I am waiting with bated breath. Do tell. I, I'm actually going to be a lot more harder on this show than you guys did are. Uh, and even Brian, who said he couldn't join us this week for personal reasons, gave the show a classic OT, I believe he said in his message. Let's see. Let me, let me quickly confirm so. that. 
It wasn't quickly. nearly as complimentary as uh, Charlie and I. That's all I know. Yeah. Oh, That's... man. Park's really going to tear it apart. He, yeah, Ooh, he, gave it a class, he gave it a classic goatee. <laughs> For me, I... The, the first two Hell in a Cell matches were great. Uh, Roman Re- the opening match with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso was great storytelling from the build-up to the execution of the, of the match. And from what I've read, uh, pre- uh, the people backstage, the higher-ups, gave Roman and Jey free control over their promos. So it's mainly them with some help with Paul Heyman. And it's been great stuff. It's, but it also brings back the, it makes me more infuriated to think, okay, imagine if they gave that to the entire roster. What kind of show that they had, what they, what they would have all the time with people who are dedicated to make, bringing the best, uh, ha- giving us the best show we can possibly have. So yeah, Roman Reigns versus Jey Uso, it was, a more, it was a storytelling match. It was definitely more storytelling, but it was very good storytelling. And leading to Jimmy coming in and uh, Roman crying, saying, I don't even know who I am anymore. And ch- him, well, did Roman give uh, the, that guillotine chokehold a name yet? Not to I don't my think knowledge. So. No, yeah. they've, they've been tagging the guillotine for now. Okay. And that led Jay to saying I quit to save his brother and having the wild Samoans come out and basically accept Roman as the tribal chief. Great stuff. Great stuff. Then you got the Sasha Banks and Bailey match, which I've said in the past is the, few, is the match out of all of them that actually fits into the Hell in a Cell story, considering that this feud has – this storyline has been going on for years. And like you said, Fool – Sasha and Bailey have been the highlight of the pandemic era of WWE, mainly like the performance uh, center era of WWE. And they, they were my match of the night. I, I absolutely Agreed. loved their match. It was great storytelling, especially with the chair. I believe that chair was uh, the one that Bailey used to attack Sasha in the first place. And that's the whole significant of why hmm. Bailey was so dedicated on using this chair last, even though she had other chairs, this chair meant something to the story. So again, hmm. great storytelling and great wrestling. So all around, it was it was great for me. Those two ma- those two matches alone, I would have. And if they we had great show uh, great matches for the rest of the show, I would have given this a four, possibly even a five. As for Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre, they put on a good show, but it also they had to follow two great ones and i felt like it kind of fell flat especially considering the fact that randy orton won after three pay-per-views of him constantly losing to him all of a sudden winning so it doesn't do them any it doesn't do do randy any favors and it doesn't really do drew any favors and right now i'm focusing on the show i'm not focusing on the aftermath Okay. I'm talking about the show itself on its own merits. So yeah, when it comes to that one, I would say may, the other two matches should have main evented this mat, this card. Not if anything, Drew and Orton should have opened the show. But that's my personal opinion. If anything, uh, switch the first, the first and the last matches. Oh, I can see that. And that's all I got to say, nice wise, about this pay per view. Get nasty. Get mean. Get evil. I reached that point. First, you have the, op- the pre-show match with Drew Gulak being wasted in the yeah, 24-7 wasted. championship storyline to a point where I do not care about the 24-7 championship anymore. Our tr- I like our truth but I'm tired of him as 24-7 champion. I'm tired of his promos of him throwing all these different names, the 24-7, 7-11, whatever the hell it's called, championship. I want them to do something new. I'm tired of this. Run Them basically pulling a Benny Hill, running around, trying to roll up R-Truth. I'm sick of it. 
I don't care about Akira Tozawa. I don't care about our truth. I don't care about the Lucha House Party running around. I don't, I'm, right now, it's just comedy filler that is not getting a laugh out of me. And then you have, let's see, what was the match that was after uh, Reigns and Jay? Uh, that was Elias and Jeff Hardy. A Storyline. It was just a typical Raw match. It was, there wasn't anything special about this. And it just ends on a disqualification. My question is, why? Why does this happen? What, what does I, like, what does this do for Elias winning in a disqualification? Absolutely nothing. What does this do for Jeff Hardy losing in a disqualification? Absolutely nothing. So now we just have more of who can outsmash each other with a guitar. I, that's not that's not fun storytelling for me. At this point, it's already established that Seamus is the one that's made that was the mastermind of uh, him running over Elias back in the SmackDown era with Jeff Hardy's car. And Elias is like, you know what? Jeff Hardy may have already be, may have been cleared of him not be uh, being the one that ran him over, but I don't care. I'll just use it to because I'm an asshole to, and I'm gonna sell my I'm gonna try and sell my. Uh, my new uh, album that came out. So, Which, by the way, is actually, it's actually badass. It's like le- legitimately I've good. I've heard that too. So Elias could have benefited uh, the win. I, granted, I think we all got the prediction right on that one. But it's still technically. just... What, like, what does a disqualification mean for, for either guys? Absolutely nothing. What? Other than just... Giving up, giving just give the Elias a solid win, even if it has to be heel tactics. Give him a clean, give him a solid pin victory just so you can use it to help promote his album. Then you have, I'm gonna pull the, I'm gonna pull the uh, I don't know, card up. Let's see, yeah, after Elias and Jeff Hardy was uh, Miz beating Otis for the money in the bank. Oh boy! Even with that, no. So not, not not much better there, I guess. Oh, absolutely not. It continues even more here, because now the whole story now is Tucker turning on Otis, just so Miz can win the Money in the Bank briefcase, mm-hmm. to a point where even people are arguing like, "Oh, well, at least they got it off a comedy character, off Otis," because. It's not like he's actually going to mean anything uh, when he cashes in. It's not like he's actually going to have a successful cash in. Well, my argument here is it's the exact same story with The Miz. The Miz has been booked like shit the past few years. He, him and Morrison are, being, are booked to look like nothing but total bitches. And the one time I'll actually reference the aftermath, Monday didn't help at all. They got completely annihilated by an injured uh, Drew McIntyre from him feeling the, af- the effects of Hell in a Cell, but he still decisively took them both out. So Miz winning the briefcase in 2020 means absolutely nothing because it's the, still going to be the exact same argument that w- he, when he cashes in, he's most likely going to be with... Cena uh, uh, and Sandow. And, with uh, uh, Corey. With King Corbin, where he's just going to get such... He's, he's not even probably going to have a match. He'll cash in, and whoever the champion is is just going to pull a finishing move and pin him. One, two, three. The Money in the Bank is so much of an afterthought. It has been put into the worst storyline in WWE right now. And now that The Miz has it, it, means, it still means complete and utter jack shit. And Drew McIntyre throwing the briefcase in that, in that uh, match against Miz Monday solidified that. Him chucking it to the stage and just like, well, this thing is completely trash because it, it means jack shit. No, it's, there, it's not going to matter who's going to be uh, Mr. Money in the Bank because no matter what happens, that person cashing in is going to lose. And then you... <laughs> I guess this is my response to your scholars' quick talk, Charlie. Because after the Sasha and Bailey match, you get the continued burial of retribution. And 
I need to take a drink on this one. Hmm. <laughs> Swig of clear liquid for a working man. This is it's clear liquid because it is well needed. Oh man. Now, Bobby Lashley by himself. One took out Slapjack with great ease. The time on the thing is three minutes, just under four minutes. And before even her business could come out to help him, he already took out all the other members of Retribution. <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm going to respond to what you said, fool. Comparing them to the Nexus. Oh, no. I, that <laughs> couldn't be any farther from the truth. Any farther Explain. from the truth here. Because when Nexus first showed up, they made an impact that left people talking. Retribution was made just, just to like, okay, let's, we're going to introduce a group. We don't, have, we, don't know, have any, we don't have any plans for these people. Let's have a spot. And instead it's like, ooh, they're attacking a, they're attacking a generator. Okay, so that was their first appearance. Just video footage of them setting fire a, a generator. And then the rest, and then the up continuing build, they just attack random people backstage and just draw graffiti. Before, right at the get-go, people are looking at this and like, and are just thinking, what is, what is the long, what is the long plan for this group? What is there, what is there in great wise to talk about other than just now thinking, oh, yeah, we're just going to just wreck backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. What we don't, we don't, they didn't even have a solidified group until three months of building this random group backstage. There were no solidified members other than just people in, uh, people in hoodies. When the next, when the Nexus showed up, we already, we have established who these people were, why these people are upset, and they left their mark by attacking the WWE champion, the, the biggest guy in CM Punk, and who was uh, whoever CM Punk was with at the time? I know he had. Did, did he have the Straight Edge Society on that at that time? I think he did. I think he did. Yeah, because I know he had. And then they they left the fir their first night. They had people talking, and my immediate response to it was, "This is awesome. I'm going to get a Nexus shirt." And you guys and the armband and and the armband, which I Arm still have. I think we I all had the, the armbands. I don't have the uh, shirt anymore, but I do have the armband. Yeah, I don't. When know I looked at I the first the night of retribution, say, yeah. when I looked at the first night of retribution, them attacking a gutter, I'm just thinking, gutter. <laughs> uh, them not not a, uh, them attacking a uh, a generator, them attacking a generator, like a gutter. I'm just like I'm just like uh, and that was it. That was all that they did: attack a generator, uh. Okay. <laughs> now I'm like, seeing. I'm just visualizing uh, retribution attacking people's gutters. Damn like, damn it, you gutter! Boom. <laughs> and then <laughs> chaos. Woo. And throughout gutters, the months boom. and months of random attacks backstage, and just people like, okay, we got to take this group down. They're just going. All they're doing is just flipping tape. They're they're a weak. Ver they're a pretty much a weak version of what the riot squad did. When they were like the full, when it was just the three members of them just pushing stuff off tables, like pushing the entrees off tables and j them throwing paper, throwing toilet paper. They're nothing more than just a bunch of juveniles at, at the be very beginning. And then when they finally announced the main stars, and then their immediate response after seeing their, them in their mask was, <laughs> Slapjack, <laughs> oh, T bar, woo! <laughs> Mace? Mace Windu? <laughs> we don't even know the names of the two females yet. And, but, and then one female actually went back to NXT. And then they're, they're getting completely destroyed by her business. They're getting completely destroyed by Bray Wyatt. They're getting completely destroyed by, uh, well, yeah, continue more by the her business. <laughs> at, the, at the day of this recording, they are, as a group, zero and four in matches. They haven't won a single match yet. The only thing close to victory that they got 
was this eight was that eight man tag elimination where you had Mia Reckoning do that fake seizure to distract uh, MVP and the referee where they don't look concerned. They're just looking at him like, what the hell is that? What is she doing here? Oh, yeah, and, and then uh, just a quick roll up. And them having Mustafa Ali as the leader means absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Quick so scholars, quick there talk. Is, there is absolutely nothing that they can do to make this group seem at all relevant. Jeff and, then you have the, and then you have the lackluster uh, main event where, like I said, does ab- it was okay. But it let, just like, well, okay, Randy Orton won the title. He should have won the title at the last pay-per-view. Hell, he could have at least won the title at the before pay-per-view. When he was actually still one of the hottest things as the new, as like the reinvented legend killer who also destroyed Edge in their, great, in their greatest match ever. They pretty much put a complete halt on Randy Orton What? Like, once Edge disappeared. At this point, we were just like, okay, now it hurts Drew more than it does for Randy Orton, uh, than it does for gaining Randy Orton. So when it comes to the complete view of Hell in a Cell as a whole, those two great Hell in a Cell matches, yes, they were great. But there there were little bleeps on nothing but a complete and utter bullshit pay-per-view. I'm giving it a peach fuzz. I'm giving it a two. Ooh. I was more angry than anything watching this. The first match actually gave me hope that this show would actually make the entirety of the show would actually make me look forward to it just to leave a sour taste in my mouth. Granted, there was no, no, and no contest DQ bullshit finish that the last two years gave. That's the one thing I'll give you that. I'll give that. But it left me more angry. Not as infuriated as the last two years, but it was still left me angry than anything else. So yeah, Peach Fuzz, two out of two out of five. And I have to admit, at first I thought you were going a little too over the top. But then again, after thinking about it and after how much my own personal ra- rating was based against what my initial expectations were. Yeah, I can see this being quite fair just because it seems like going in, my expectations were relatively low and yours were relatively high. So, given oh, no. this is my I expectations weren't high at all, well, just, they certainly seem higher than mine were, I guess. Well, like, my, mine were okay. like low, low. I'll put it this way I'll put it this way. My expectations when the show started were very, very low after the first match. I was my expectations raised a little bit. Okay, I will I say that. that it was after the first match, and then the Sasha Banks and Bailey match. Essentially, the SmackDown side of Hell in a Cell was great. The Raw side just left a sour taste in my mouth, and because there were only two SmackDown matches, and let's see, the twenty four seven title opener, the fuck man, I keep forgetting. The, El- the Elias, Je- Elias Jeff Hardy, the Retribution, Orton and Drew Mack, four out of two. Two SmackDown, four Raw, and everything on Raw left me more angry than, than the happiness that SmackDown gave me. Hmm. Okay, I won't argue with that. However, I do have a little scholar's quick talk before we move on to our next segment. Who would win in a fight? Retribution? Or Tozawa's ninjas. Have at it. What's the difference? They're both guys in, in black attire. Mask covered in masks. You'll lose you'll lose you'll lose focus on which one is which, and then they all end up taking each other out. Hell, even the League of Nations had more of an impact oh. than retribution. At least they wow. actually at least they have won matches. At least they are. They, wrestled Esta- up. they were established stars when they got when they formed up. Right now, with Retribution, the only established star that we like is Ali. Hmm. And what has he? And what had? What did he do? 
Oh, yeah, he pinned Daniel Bryan when he was WWE Championship. He got injured afterwards, and then his, his storyline went to Kofi Kingston. And guess what? Kofi blew it out of the water. And then you get Ali doing, I'm a superhero promos. I'm the SmackDown hacker, which only lasted for only, you know, a month. Mm. Yeah, when your most established star is such low-tier talent, that's all, that's all WWE, and that's all, w, and that's all the fans are going to be looking at this. Just nothing but lower, a lower-card group that is not going to accomplish anything. <laughs> they need a win soon or they're not anything. Um, it's, a, it's sad that Dominic Dijakovic is a part of this. Yeah. I keep forgetting that's him. I really do. He's T. I do not he's T. Bar. To answer your question, Jeff, at this point, the ninjas would win by a landslide. Um, and yeah, like anyone short of the ECW zombie could beat Retribution at this point. So, uh, what a shame! What a shame. But hell, speaking of, yes. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the whole Tucker turning heel. What did they do with him after they had him turn heel? He lost in main event against Umberto Carrillo. Main I event. didn't even know that happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I didn't even know that happened either. Oof. Main event. Big oof. To Umberto Carrillo. They had no plans for Tucker turning heel. There's not going to be a Tucker versus oh, Otis no. match. Since what? They're not even going to be a cross promotion match for Survivor Series. They have nothing for T Tucker, and they're I don't know what they're going to be doing with Otis. He wasn't even on this episode of SmackDown. Wow. Neither uh, of them were on Raw or I SmackDown. I, no, Tuckus wasn't on Raw. Nope. Oh, wow. But, um, yeah, initially when you said, and what about what they did with Tuckus afterwards, I thought you were going to talk about showcasing the reason why the man hasn't been anywhere near a mic in his time in uh, Heavy Machinery. But that, that promo. was god-awful. That, oh, my God. His that promo, promo explaining what? Dog shit. I actually, I actually didn't mind it very much because it was just – it was kind of those like, okay, it's not a you you fans did it. It's just Otis getting the whole thing over his head, getting over his head on this, and me always trying to bail him out no more. I'm like, you know what? I like it. It's just it just was over scripted, which I've even like I've said before. Roman and Jay are pretty much having having their own freedom when it comes to their promos. If they allowed their entire roster to do that. Imagine how like real these promos would sound. Mm -hmm. It's like I said, it left me more infuriated than anything. I think when it comes to allowing the whole roster to have that creative freedom, I think WCW comes back to a lot of people's minds, and they're like, oh, "Let's not give too much freedom now." At least enough to act like not full cre not full control, like what they did in WCW. Just enough, like, here's the guidelines. Present it how you would, not over-scripted. Not, like, I, be more fluent in your promos. Say, here, here's, like, bullet points on what you need, to, on what needs to be said. But you can still do it yourself and make it sound like it's coming from you, not coming from a whole, like, an overly scripted promo. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, boy. Well, you certainly can't win them all, and fool, I certainly can't blame you for your rating. But speaking of WCW on the bright side of life, this Halloween week we also had from NXT the return of Halloween Havoc as hosted by one Miss Shotzi Blackheart. And this one was a fun one. As far as free, free shows go, this one was a fun one. Uh... Same deal. Pitching it to you guys. How much of this did you happen to catch from Halloween Havoc? Uh, and overall thoughts, and what did you think of the show? I actually haven't watched this one yet, but I do have it DVR'd, and I actually am planning on watching it, especially after the 
praise I've been reading and that uh, like the praise it's gotten and the fact that it actually did do better than Dynamite Kick. Granted, most people are just thinking, well, of course, it's a gimmick show. Of course, it's going to be top. It's going to be better. But I'm not taking I'm not taking away from what I've read on both shows. I, I watched I did watch Dynamite, well, at least most of it. Once again, it's just more of me f- watching the uh, the tournament and Orange Cassidy versus Cody Rose is what I really watched. Dynamite just is still like, was this, this their best show? No, but it was still good enough. It was still good mm-hmm. TV. It was still good wrestling coming from them. I really don't. The only real negative thing that I have to say about AEW right now is that they're not really pushing their women's division as hard as they could with their uh, TV title and their tag team titles and their world titles that one it, that's more of an after the afterthought and it just when i read uh the people that are uh apparent like and who signed it to who signed to nxt uk this week like some big name big uh big female wrestler signed to nx wwe nxt uk while they that and aew are trying to go for her but she chose that because yeah the the women's uh, division there still still needs to find its mark. But when mm. it comes to Halloween Havoc, I still need to watch it, but I still know the results of it. I still read the results. And yeah, it is. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the match that Dexter Loomis is in with zombies. And apparently that match basically <laughs> took the entire show. It was similar to that one uh, match with Goldust versus... Yes. Oh, uh, Roddy Piper. Uh, Roddy Piper all those years ago? Yes. yes. It, w- it was very similar. It was done in a very... It was shot in a very similar way. And uh, yeah, yeah. Johnny Gargano as the new North American champion, which I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that match against uh, Damian Priest. Uh, uh, let's see. What was the main event? Uh, let's brain see. Party. Okay. Uh, it was Io Shirai and Candice LeRae in a tables, ladders, and scares match. I, I'm looking forward to that one because I just heard great things about that. So yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm... Mini spoiler, uh, they find a a bag of rubber body, dissevered body parts. And I think like Io Shirai hits Candice LeRae in the face with, a, with like a severed leg or something. I'm sorry, now that I heard that, all I think about is... Uh... Halloween Resurrection, where they think they find corpses of Michael Myers' victims, and then one guy just looks at it, he's like, you gotta be kidding. Made in fucking Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's shot, that's like, it's silly, but it's also kind of amusing, but also kind of lame. Like, you can't tell if, like, okay, am I supposed to take this seriously? <laughs> you, were bl- you, were, you were cutting out, Charlie, what did you say? I said that was the feeling of the whole night, though. It was silly and fun and lame. It was fantastic. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually like sitting down and actually watching this show. You have to text us in the group chat after you watch that, uh, that house match. Haunted house match. Oh, okay. I definitely yeah. will. Fantastic. Yeah, can- they turn Cameron Grimes into a complete cartoon character. Uh, Best way possible. Yeah. It's like they turn him into Funky Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cameron Grimes is a complete tool. Uh, Dexter <laughs> Loomis is like... Dexter. <laughs> Dexter Loomis yeah, feels like... Yeah, Dexter Loomis feels like a slasher in the wrong movie. Like you'll yeah. you'll see what I mean when you see it. And he really is better than both the salami and the bologna combined. <laughs> okay. On that note, scholars quick talk. <laughs> if he's better than both the salami and the bologna combined, who is the salami and who's the bologna? Go. Uh let's see. Uh, Candice LeRae is the baloney. 
because why not? Uh, <laughs> I love that he's taking so long to think of it. Too. Well, there's you have to really think about it. Like, are we talking and about you know what? I'm just gonna say uh Pete Dunn is the oh, is the salami for turning heel. For turning for turning heel. Face. Oh my god. He's got the derpy face for that. That works. I just he, with when he turned when he actually turned heel. I I was just expecting. No. Pete, just, Pete, Pete, you're right. With the phone. Pete Dunn. Pete Dunn is the salami, and then no, Pete Dunn is the salami, and Adam Cole is the baloney. That's the way he pops oh, through the phone. I hate baloney. <laughs> You know what? Yeah, let's just yeah. That uh, going uh, in, I did not. T, T McAfee is the salami, and uh, undisputed era is baloney. Oh, that boy. was the result. Uh, that was the result of. I hate baloney. <laughs> hate baloney. By beating him with a phone. Uh, <laughs> Being done in his derpy face. Oh, oh boy, I love it. I love wrestling. <laughs> More so importantly, much. let's spin that. Who's going to be the jar of mayo that we just see on camera for like for an entire 10 minutes? minutes. Uh, <laughs> who is the jar of mayonnaise? Cameron who? Grimes. Well, no, Cameron Grimes is too zesty. No, Cameron Grimes is like burger sauce. It's just sort of zesty <laughs> and goes on everything. You throw them anywhere on the card and it makes sense. Uh... <laughs> Mayonnaise has to be like something that some people just love, but other people hate, and you need to just display it on your screen for like 10 minutes, and people <laughs> think it's amazing. You know what? <laughs> Dexter <laughs> Loomis is mayonnaise. <laughs> oh, no, no, he, no. Some people love him, some people hate him, but you know what? All he needs to do is just stand there for 10 minutes, and it just gets it gets the ratings. No, th this this is mayonnaise. I don't know if you can see. Can't see it. Oh, it's like fading in and out of your green screen effect. Oh, it's re Regal. Show a picture of Regal there. Regal is mayonnaise. Well, you know what? Regal would pop the ratings. Regal People is mayonnaise. Oh, boy. <laughs> this analogy went totally off the rails. Hey, man. I, was, I actually thought about mayonnaise. I'm like, yeah, it's Regal. Because... Regal is everyone loves Regal, and everyone loves the jar, the jar of mayonnaise. I was gonna say, do do either of you even like mayonnaise, or it's like, is this gonna be a favorable thing or not? Not uh, by itself, no. 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 Who? It has no. to be with. It has to be like in in a sandwich for me to like yeah. it. Well, how else? How else does one eat mayonnaise? Don't answer that. Yeah. Anyway, with yeah, a spoon is... and in a jar, or just put it. Uh. <laughs> No, keep, no, you know what? No, to keep going with the Halloween, to keep going with the Halloween tradition, you paint your face red, put a whole thing of mayonnaise in your mouth, and when someone asks you what you are for Halloween, <clears throat> I'm a zit. Uh, uh, Never look at mayonnaise the same way again. Uh, brain, okay, brain bleach time. <laughs> All right, brain bleach, brain bleach, brain bleach. Yes. How do you think Shotzi Blackheart did as the MC of the night? I thought she got into a character super hard and she dug it. She struck me as NXT's version of Elvira. I, it, it was too good. Now I just want to see with a Mr. Skullhead bow on the top of her head. <laughs> oh, not El Elvira. That for Lexi. Elvira, I'm sorry. I thought you said uh, Elmira from Tiny oh. Toons. <laughs> <laughs> Very no. <laughs> That's why the whole Mr. Skullhead. I'm sorry. It did, and then I'm like, oh, you said Elvira? Okay, never mind. <laughs> the life out of poor... Much love to Cassandra Peterson, kids. <laughs> Squeezing the life out of poor defenseless animals. Oh, boy. <laughs> wow, we are going off the rails on a crazy train tonight. If you don't like cartoon nostalgia, this, this show's not for you tonight. Yes. Speaking of which, you know they're bringing actually bringing back Tiny Toons. No. Yep. 
I hope they don't give it like a, tw- a modern art style twist like some of these shows that they're bringing back. They like, recreated Animaniacs just fine, it seems. I, so, I, I, I see the trailer for that still. It looks like they're it looks like they're gonna kill it. So if hey, if they're bringing back Tiny Tunes, and Ducktales hey, is awesome. Yeah, see, they another one that they completely killed it on. So hey. <laughs> So, all that aside, I, Fool, I know you haven't seen it yet, but, uh, Charlie, overall ratings for uh, Halloween Havoc? I dug it. It was a fun night. Um, I think I'd give it, like, a... Uh, you guys are going to kill me, but what would, what would like, a 3.5 be? Uh, a high classic goatee, like... A Wait, what was the question? Be, what was a three? What would a three point five be on the beard scale? I guess it's yeah, like a high classic goatee. Yeah, a classic goatee, but with like the rest of the beard coming in, like kind of like okay. what I got, but a little bit shorter. Okay. It, it it's a a three point five is a Jeff rating. Let's put it that way. I give it the Jeff the head. I'm, I'm naming talking it about, like when you're saying the oh. Jeff rating, it's just how your facial hair is right now. Yeah, yeah, it's like a three point five. Come on, just show off. Come on, yeah. look, look both ways. Show your, show off your facial yeah, hair. That's uh, like a legit yeah. class. Yours is like a legit classic goatee. Like you know, it's it's what you think of when you think of a goatee. Yeah. Mine's like a little longer in the goatee area, but it's just like a little bit shorter around the sides where the rest of the beard would be. Charlie is his more like a full beard. What do you think that? Charlie's is a full beard. Who are you kidding? Yeah. It's not yeah. not more like a full. It is. A full beard. <laughs> I'm stumbled across my words. Damn it! Leave me alone. You damn it! Yeah, damn it! <laughs> uh, I think Lucille there is messing with your head. She's thirsty. Leave her alone. She needs more clear liquid. Anywho, as for me, I honestly I would give this uh, a uh, four out of five full beard. This one was, again, another show where I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but for what it was, it's, it delivered. It was a fun Halloween-themed show. Shotzi was going nuts the entire night. Again, Loomis versus Grimes was wonky, but completely on brand. And uh, Io Shirai and Candice LeRae had a fun little ladder match, and Poppy came out and sung Io, Io Shirai out to the ring. So it's... a uh, it's a good quality NXT show, not quite uh, takeover level, but there's some spatterings of brilliance there. That if you watch it, you can definitely see how they managed to beat AEW for a, a rare victory for them. So, kudos to NXT four out of five full beard. Here, I got a scholar's quick talk for you, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Since they're actually, since NXT is actually succeeding. With the Halloween, like with the Halloween themed a show that the main roster couldn't do with just the re- Halloween themed matches instead of. Do you see NXT doing more like having these uh, holiday themed shows based on like past wrestling shows and like wrestling shows of the past? I definitely can. However, I don't really think there's too many of them that can be real. They can really do too much with uh, NXT outside. December to Dismember. <laughs> I was gonna say you better not go there, but oh boy, you went there too late. I mean, okay. I don't think I don't think that's got quite the kind of uh, nostalgia value that Halloween Havocs and Great American Bashes do. Like those are the two holiday themed things that I can really think of that have any sort of real nostalgia value to them. Unless they're out of ideas and they want to get really really like cheeky with their references then I'd say maybe there's an outside chance that they might pull a dis- December to dismember. I was going to say I could see it as a mockery to themselves. Like, Yeah. yeah, Not as the ECW but just as just Christmas themed Yeah. A Christmas themed show. NXT, December to dismember. Uh-oh, we're doing it again. <laughs> this, t- this time, we'll get it right. Ho, ho, ho. 
<laughs> and they bring back Bobby Lashley and have him win the main event again. Oh, jeez. Now they'll come with machine guns. Ho, ho, oh. ho. <laughs> Uh, and then you can just bring in Tommy Dreamer for like five minutes to walk around confused. What year is it? <laughs> Why am I even here? <laughs> and then so a, ha- a disembodied hand just come floats around over the screen, hands him a check. Oh, that's why I'm here. Speaking of Tommy Dreamer, did anyone see Rosemary's what? Uh, Rosemary's wedding? No. Yes. I no. kind of that one. I actually kind of refused. To watch of oh, I, I refused until I heard what happened. So then I'm like, okay, this is ultimate cheese. I have to go check this out. And I used My response it. is, oh my God, they're pulling a who shot Mr. Burns. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if they actually capitalize, it'll probably be one of the more entertaining things that that impact has done in quite a while. Yeah. But that's just my guess. It was me, Austin. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so overall, this show was a ton of fun. Fool, I absolutely recommend you watch it. Uh, oh boy, I'm, going to it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be a great way to spend your spend your Saturday how ha- your Halloween Saturday. Uh, but let's see. After all, last year we did get. Uh, I'm sure we're not going to get something big happening like a a fiend win- the fiend winning the title. But yeah, that's quite enough. And what they're, what we're seeing the fiend do with Alexa Bliss, and did you hear they got uh, new music, theme music for Alexa Bliss? At, they just deb- debuted it on Monday Night Raw. Did anyone did even they? catch that? No, I bec- no. Is it be- because she was already in the ring? I guess I just ha- I have to listen to it because it's I didn't. It's very quick. Okay, it's but very quick. I, but I it's like say- warped. It's like a warped version of her theme, but it's like they've got like vo- like little voice clips here and there, just like her like giggling like evil. Like it, it's actually pretty pretty awesome. It's my jam. It, I dig it. This was one of my most favorite episodes of Firefly Funhouse. I absolutely loved it. I I'm not shocked. Knowing your taste, I'm not shocked at all. I'm. So- just that shot when she announced that Ray, Randy Orton was going to be on a moment of bliss and just the blank expression <laughs> on Bray's face and just him turning to the painting. And I'm just like, this is yeah. so goddamn good. I love, I love every second of this, which I'm now uh, – I'm, it makes me now worried about Randy Orton versus The Fiend. I guess they're still going to focus on – uh, Orton versus McIntyre again for right now, and then also Survivor Series. Hmm. It's just I'm really not looking forward to Randy Orton versus the Feed now because Randy Orton is the champion, and the whole idea is them wanting Edge versus Randy Orton at Mania. So hmm. it's obvious that Randy Orton is going to come out uh, on top of the Fiend feud, which. No, I don't want. I want to see a second Firefly Funhouse with Randy Orton, hmm. and pretty much we get the "This is your life, Randy Orton" in the Firefly Funhouse in a Firefly Funhouse match, similar to what they did with Cena. Because I still love the Firefly Funhouse match. Mm-hmm. Nothing for me right now. Nothing has topped that as one of my most favorite things this year. Yeah, I can't definitely can't disagree with you. Although, as divisive as it was, given that it worked with Cena, hey, Cena pull, and him, Bray pulled it off. It was the right result and beyond our expectations. Personally, though, I'm I honestly I'm, I can't say that with much certainty that of what they're going to be doing with the the Fiend and. Randy Orton at this point because it still seems like they plan on going ahead with the main match being Orton versus Reigns but I'm still I'm curious they got to do something with the Fiend the Fiend is one of their best characters I'm just I'm still asking the question okay are they, is he going to snake his way into uh, Fiend versus Reign or Uh, Orton versus Reigns somehow make it a triple threat is he going to interfere in the match and 
continue the, the feud on for the rest of the year leading up into the Royal Rumble. For me, in my taste, it's it's still very much up in the air. But that's just what I think, anyway. Uh, it's just anyway, your optimist point of view. Hopeful that uh, they're actually going to be doing something with one of my favorite wrestling characters today, but hey. Uh-huh. Hope like, springs uh-huh. eternal. Hope springs eternal. Uh, but that, those are our thoughts. Those are our reactions to this spooky block of WWE programming this week. But now is the time where we turn it over to Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. You are wrestling, listening, viewing, and reviewing audience. Let me know what you think. Let's all know what you think. What did you think of Halloween Havoc? What did you think of Hell in a Cell? Did the show work or did it with us? Or did it? are you with Tarek and it just fell short of what you wanted? Whatever you I'm think. I'm the only person that actually thought negative on that, that I've seen that thought negative on Hell in a Cell. I, I don't know. I, there's, I, People, have, I find that a little hard to believe. I'm sure that there's plenty of that. Because it's that, not like an unreasonable view they had. For, for most people, the two Hell in a Cell matches were enough. To, like, it was too much of a good thing for them. A lot. That's for that was a lot of people. I'm. Hmm. I actually haven't seen many people who are negative on the show as I am. Interesting. Whatever you think, if you're watching this, comment. Leave us a comment wherever you are, all across the internet. YouTube comments, Facebook comments. Or you can just drop us a line directly on our Twitter accounts. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you think. So if you want to join us on Twitter, find us at any of our normal pages. You can check us out at our main page at Scholars OW for all the latest episode uploads, including this one. Or you can also join the conversation and track us down on our personal Twitter accounts. Fool, where can they reach you? You can reach me thinking of how much they're going to suck Vince McMahon's dick in his new Netflix documentary at The Avatar. And Charlie, where can he reach you? Charlene. Charlene. And you can reach just Charlie. <laughs> and you can reach me at I'm Robbie Rage. And with that, that's our show. Enjoy the rest of your Halloween. Be safe. Get as much candy as you possibly can while maintaining social distance. But then again, you knew we were going to say something like that because you know who we are. We are the scholars of wrestling, and you have just been schooled. You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a happy Halloween, everybody. La, 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 la.